Welcome everyone to our online service here at City Church. My name's Jay. I'm the director of worship here, and it's a pleasure to be able to lead you in worship today. Uh, this morning, uh, or whenever you're watching this, uh, is the first week of what we call Advent. And here at City Church, we observe Advent as we lead uh, towards Christmas and celebrating celebrating Christmas together. And just a reminder about Advent, we uh, what Advent really is, is a observation. It's observing both the first coming and anticipation of Christ, uh, as well as uh, observing and in, 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 in our present day, hoping and looking towards the return of Christ. So not only did the people of Israel live in an Advent season waiting for their Messiah, but we live right now in an Advent season waiting for Christ's return. And so that's what this season does. It helps us reflect on those truths and uh, looking back in wonder and looking forward in hope. And so uh, we're going to begin today with our first, we we light candles during the Advent season, and we're going to light the first candle of Advent, and I'm going to read a passage of scripture uh, in light of that. But before we do that, listen to this, um, listen to this. It says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So we light this first candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. And listen to Isaiah 9 verse 2. And this is our call to worship as well. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Would you pray with me as we begin? Let's pray. Oh God, that we would help us, that we would observe Advent season in, with, with hope, with hopefulness. Give us fresh eyes to observe this first Advent as Isaiah predicts. Uh, the coming of the Messiah. Help us to see it with wonder, but also help us to look forward to your return, Christ, with hope. And with that combination of wonder and hope, may we worship you right now, together as the body of Christ. We need your help with this, Lord. We can't do this on our own. So would your spirit be with us, meet us here. Help us with all of this, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together. Born our souls 
souls to rescue, born to save your very own, long expected Jesus, make our hearts your home. Sing that first verse. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation joy of every Redeemer, come Emmanuel, bless the nations with your presence here. Born thy souls to rescue, born to save your very own, long expected Jesus, make our hearts your own. Bless the nations with your presence here. Born our souls to rescue, born to save your very own. Long expected Jesus, make our hearts your home. See, church family, I love you. It's great to be with you. My name is Chipper. I'm one of the pastors here at City Church. We are a church aspiring to be an authentic community, walking with God in our city. This is the first Sunday of Advent. Praise God, we made it. Um, it kind of felt like maybe we wouldn't make it this year in 2020, but we are here. That is worth celebrating, and it's a timely Advent season. Let me tell you, and we will say more about that, in just a few moments. We would love to be praying for you this week. Consider filling out a connection card virtually uh, with your name and your prayer request, or you can leave it uh, blank, make it anonymous, uh, citychurchgnv.com slash connection. Uh, also a great way to reach out to us with questions about what we believe, who we are. We would love to be in dialogue with you uh, via phone or email or whatever might be best. So please consider using that form we worship a generous God. Part of our responsive worship as a people of God is giving generously. Um, the best way to give right now is online, citychurchgnv.com slash give. Or if you feel safe doing so, you can always join us in person outdoors at First Magnitude at 9 a.m. or 1045 a.m. Uh, in the heart of downtown Gainesville, not far from our building. And of course, uh, you can worship with us. And if you want to give in person, you can do that there. There's a a box that we have available at our in-person outdoor services. As I mentioned last week, we will continue to meet outdoors at least until the end of 2020 and uh, probably beyond that for a little while as well. We are doing a special Christmas celebration on December the 13th, and we will, of course, be doing that live in person, but we will also be recording that just like we do our other virtual services. So uh, on the 13th, you'll have a special uh, Sunday Christmas celebration if you're watching virtually, and I hope that you are looking forward to that. We'll also have um, an in-person outdoor Christmas Eve service on December 24th. Uh, that one won't be virtual. It'll just be in-person outdoors. Um, and so I hope that we will see you there, and that will be in an alternate location. We'll tell you more about that uh, in the coming weeks. Our scripture passage this first Sunday of Advent is from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Lu Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. If you have a Bible, we'd love it if you would pull that out and follow along with us. 
the scripture passage will also be up on the screen. Before I read that scripture text, I want to say a few things about this Advent season. Advent is a season in which we wait together for Jesus' coming. And we do this in part by recounting the events that led up to Jesus' inaugural coming, the incarnation realized in the birth of Jesus, and we do this in part by longing together for Jesus' second coming, a a future return guaranteed by Jesus' resurrection and ascension into the presence of the Father. Our Advent series this year is called Christ Over All. Uh, Two words there, Christ Over All, because we're going to see what Christ's past and future comings have to say about fear, isolation, injustice, and death. Fear, isolation, injustice, and death. And if that feels like a fun little summary of the difficulties we've been dealing with in 2020, you would be picking up on exactly what we're putting down. Our desire this Advent season is to magnify Christ, who is indeed above all of these difficulties, and to consider what that means for us now and in the future. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and read our text, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. This is God's word to us. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Let's pray together. Lord Almighty, would you use this Advent message in the whole series, Father, to address the the various difficulties we are wrestling with, including, as we will see this morning, fear. It's been a season of, of great fear for many people, overwhelming fear. And so by the power of your spirit, would you speak directly into that right now as we gather virtually? I pray that we would leave here encouraged in the Lord, that you would lift up our heads. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in January of 2020, after some military engagements with Iran, we were afraid of a potential World War III. In February, we were increasingly afraid that the new coronavirus might make its way into the United States. In March, after the virus reached our shores, we were afraid of illness and death. 
and April, we were increasingly afraid of the economic repercussions of the virus, especially as lockdowns persisted and job losses mounted. In May and June, we were increasingly afraid that the fabric of our nation might disintegrate under the weight of racial injustice, as well as mounting discord about the right and wrong ways to handle the virus. In July, we were fearful once again about illness and death as hospital capacity in the state of Florida uh, ballooned and we experienced a massive spike in COVID cases. In August, we were afraid of either resuming school or not resuming school, depending on your perspective. In September and October, we were afraid of the potential outcomes of our national election. In November, we've again been afraid of the uncertainties of a contested election result. And then, of course, yet again, there's more virus. So by my math, We've collectively been spooked for about a year now. There just hasn't been any trick-or-treating to go with it, except for one day, but of course we all know how the national conversation about that went. And now we find ourselves at the front end of perhaps the most timely Advent season in our lifetime. It's timely for many, many reasons, as we'll see this morning and in the coming weeks, but for now I will simply say this. It's timely because it has something to say about fear. It has something to say about fear, and we'll explore that by considering first a word of comfort and then second an exhortation. Here's a word of comfort. Church, there is love beneath the chaos. There's love beneath the chaos. And then second, the exhortation, let's replace fear with fear. First, the word of comfort. Children of God, there is love beneath the chaos. We are not the first group of people to experience an extended season of social upheaval, political tension, and physical and emotional suffering. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But we're not the first to experience all of that. If you want proof, consider the context of Jesus' birth. The Jewish people were under the not-so-friendly, generally quite oppressive rule of the Romans. Caesar Augustus, as you see in in verse 1, referred to uh, in that verse, was functionally a military dictator who who kind of tolerated the Jewish people but had no problem dropping the hammer if necessary. He also had no problem declaring an empire-wide census, which was an enormous pain in the rear, fraught with inconveniences and risks for those who had to participate. For example, according to the rules of the census, and you You see this in verses 3 through 5. Joseph and Mary had to travel all the way from Nazareth to Joseph's basic, basically his hometown of Bethlehem in order to be officially registered. Did it matter at all that Mary was very pregnant? Absolutely not. Did it matter? The Romans didn't care about that. And yet, the physical rigor of the 90-mile journey with, by the way, an exhilarating 2,600-foot climb at the end of it, that journey clearly posed a physical threat to the health of Mary and the baby. Plus, the journey meant potential exposure to all sorts of novel illnesses as strangers from different parts of the empire crossed paths. Plus, the journey meant potential exposure to bandits who were looking to ambush unsuspecting travelers. All of this so the Roman government could make absolutely sure that they were squeezing every possible tax dollar out of their populace. Now, sorry for the massive threats to Europe, physical and emotional 
well-being. Uh, sorry to suddenly disrupt all of your relationships with friends and family. We just want to make sure we're maximizing our tax revenue. There are so many reasons, church, in that day to be afraid. There are so many reasons to be afraid. Not to mention angry when you consider that a lot of this was the result of, of arbitrariness and injustice on the part of the Roman government. If we've been wrestling with fear and anger these past nine months, and I know a lot of us have been, no doubt we would have been equally, if not more afraid and angry in Mary and Joseph's day. Every single one of our tweets would have been in all caps. And now let's make things rather complicated. Are you ready? Let's make things pretty complicated. The Roman government actually wasn't acting independently. Unbeknownst to them, their actions catalyzed a sequence of events that fulfilled biblical prophecy. Because of the census, Jesus was born in Bethlehem just as God had planned in Scripture had foretold. You can read about this for yourself in the book of Micah, chapter 5. So it's not like the Romans were doing their thing and then God was kind of over here desperately trying to make the most of it. It was, it was all his thing, ultimately. It was all his plan. He even called this shot hundreds of years before it happened. And it was all his thing. And this is where it gets difficult. It was all his thing, even though it involved significant Hardships and countless occasions for fear. Consider the Apostle Paul's description of the incarnation in the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. He writes this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. In other words, this specific set of circumstances was the fullness of time. That is, the perfectly right and planned time for God to send His Son into the world. God drew this whole thing up. How does that sit with you? How does that sit with you? You know what? Here's one more thing. This this one's for free. Notice that, that even God's own angelic messenger service wasn't exactly chill. After Jesus' birth in a manger, probably in the common room in the home of one of Joseph's relatives, not a stable, God Almighty didn't pick a low-key way to make the announcement. He didn't get online and make a cute little card on Shutterfly. He didn't get online and make a Facebook post. Instead, and you see this in verses 8 and 9, he commissioned an angel of the Lord to suddenly appear before some shepherds in the middle of the night in a blaze of divine glory. Unsurprisingly, upon seeing the angel, the shepherds were terrified. They were filled with great fear. In fact, when the angel appeared and assessed the situation, the first thing he felt compelled to say in response was, fear not, you don't need to be afraid. He saw the fear. It's like, okay, great, but, but you're the one who caused the problem in the first place. You're the one who came out of nowhere with, with the big light show. This kind of feels like me waking my kids up in the morning by banging on a pot with a serving spoon and saying, you know, no reason to be concerned, I'm... I have good news. Okay, great, but why did you have to bang on the pot? Church, do you see the picture that's emerging? Do you see the picture that's emerging? When God was orchestrating one of these central acts of his redemptive plan, ease and convenience and physical comfort and emotional tranquility We're not a part of the experience at all. Instead, it was kind of chaotic. It was dramatic. And there was 
plenty of suffering and even occasions for fear. But, and here's the word of comfort, finally, thankfully. Here's the word of comfort. There is so much love beneath this chaos. There is so much love beneath this chaos. How much? Well, here's the, here's the rest of Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, and continuing in to verse 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. We were crushed and condemned underneath the weight of a law that we could not keep. So God the Father, who is by his very nature merciful and gracious and and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, He sent His own Son into the world. And that Son was born of Mary and born under the law, so that in keeping it perfectly, and eventually going to the cross, He might redeem sinners like us. Sinners that had no chance otherwise. And now when we put our hope in the Son of God, we become the adopted children of God. That's how much love, that's how much love was underneath the chaos of the heavy handed Roman government and a taxing journey to Bethlehem and, and the glorious yet certainly troubling appearance of the angels, both to the shepherds and even to Mary, as you can see back. In Luke chapter 1. And this is why the angel announced to the terrified shepherds, as you can see in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 2, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I, I know things are a little disconcerting right now, but take heart. We're having a birthday party for the Messiah. The one who has come to save God's people. You can put up with quite a lot when you know that there's love beneath the chaos. You can put up with some pretty serious storms when you know, as another author has put it, that there's love beneath the wave. And you know, church, at all times, the children of God can be certain that there's love beneath the chaos. At all times, the the God of the universe who is merciful and gracious is working for your best interests and cherishes you as his adopted children more than you can possibly know. What a world of comfort that can bring to fearful people. Knowing this doesn't necessarily change our our circumstances. I, I can't promise you that at all. But it does change our orientation to those circumstances. It does change our orientation to those circumstances. You know, this helps us understand why the Apostle Paul, very interestingly, didn't generally focus his prayers on changes in circumstances. We might have expected this from the Apostle Paul because he was personally experiencing great suffering or, or, or writing to people experiencing great difficulties and distress. But instead of praying for changes to their earthly estate, you want to know what he prayed for? Here's one example, Ephesians Chapter 3, verse 19, he prayed for this, that you, that is, Ephesian Christians, may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. Time and time again, Paul's prayerful zeal for the people of God was that they might know about the love beneath the chaos. 
And not just intellectual knowledge. We're talking about heart knowledge that transforms everything about the way we think, everything about the way that we live. Heart knowledge that, that transforms our desires. So that our desire to experience God relegates to twists and the turns of everyday life to the backseat of the van. And during the Advent season, we have the opportunity to reflect on one of the preeminent expressions of God's love. Consider 1 John 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Church, I share in Paul's zeal. My desire for all of you is that you might know the love underneath the chaos in the storm. The love that persists beneath the chaos in the storms. The love that guarantees that God is not wasting the chaos in the storms, but is indeed using them to build within us a godly endurance that produces character, which produces a hope that will not put us to shame. So many people seem to be buying stock in 2021. It's like buying Apple stock 15 years ago. You know, if we can just make it to January, things will start looking up. That's the living hope for a lot of people right now, a a calendar flip. I got to tell you, though, I'm not hoping for this or even expecting this, but it's entirely possible that 2021 could be as bad or worse than 2020. So instead of banking on earthly relief to alleviate our fears, can we please bank on the love of God to comfort our hearts no matter what we experience tomorrow or next month or next year. Can we rejoice in love of God that we know lies beneath the chaos? And can we rejoice in knowing that that God is working for our good? God's got a love for us, sometimes unseen, sometimes beneath the chaos that will not fail us. He will carry us ultimately into the full riches of our inheritance stored up for us by God in heaven. However, and now you might get upset with me. As my five-year-old daughter likes to say, I played a little trick on you. Even after walking through all of this, there actually is a kind of fear that's worth pursuing. And it's a fear that pushes out the other fear. And that brings us to our exhortation. We had the word of comfort. There's there's love beneath the chaos church, but now the exhortation. Let's replace fear with fear. There's a transformation in Luke chapter 2 that's actually more of a pattern if you also consider a similar sequence of events in chapter 1. As we already saw, upon the very sudden arrival of the angel, the shepherds were filled not just with fear, but with great fear. But then they experienced three things, three events. Number one, they heard the announcement concerning the good news of the birth of the Savior, good news that was for people exactly like them. Number two, and you see this in verses 13 and 14, they saw a multitude of angels suddenly join the first angel to sing a praise chorus that went like this, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And then number three in verses 15 and 20, they saw the baby Jesus for themselves, lying in a manger. And here's the outcome of those experiences. You see it in verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying 
and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. They experienced the glory and the goodness of God in breathtaking ways. And these ended up being transformative experiences that caused them to worship God by by glorifying and praising Him with reverent yet joyous awe. In other words, it caused them to worshipfully fear the Lord. And this indeed becomes something of a pattern when we consider Mary's encounter with the angel Gabriel back in chapter 1. Initially, she, as you can see in verse 29, was greatly troubled and she was trying to discern the nature of Gabriel's presence and and greeting. But then the angel Gabriel gave the full announcement to Mary, and including this, this good news we were just talking about, and then Mary received additional confirmation of the good news when she visited with Elizabeth. And here's the result of all of that. Humble, reverent worship in submission to God's plan. In fact, there's a whole praise song about it that you can read for yourself in chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And for our purposes this morning, I'll just mention one of the stanzas. It goes like this. In His, this is Mary singing to the Lord. In His, that is the Lord's mercy, is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Mary's fearful response to Gabriel when he first arrived, eventually gave way to a very different sort of reverent fear, a a humble fear of the Lord that she worshipfully commended to every generation that would succeed her. And so it turns out that the Christian journey isn't so much about getting rid of fear, It's about having the right kind of fear. A fear of the Lord that Proverbs chapter 9 says is the beginning of wisdom. The kind of fear the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 34 when he writes, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Profound encounters with the love of God and the splendor of his glory they create in God's children, a humbly reverent, worshipful, submissive, all-consuming fear of the Lord. Fear that reminds us that the children of God, his precious possession, have no lack. Fear that, that crowds out the space for earthly fear. And church, would you, would you hang on to that last bit? Dealing with our earthly fears isn't so much about, you know, simply sucking it up and, and, and just not trying to be afraid anymore. And simply telling yourself that everything is going to be just fine. Pastors and, and counselors alike would generally tell you that that's kind of a fool's errand. But I would say, that there's a way of suffocating earthly fear by transferring the oxygen flow to a worshipful fear of the Lord. And how does that happen? How does that, how does that transfer of oxygen actually occur? By encountering the riches of the glory of God and the goodness of his mission and work in the world, just like the shepherds, just like Mary. And how do we encounter God in this way, especially if we aren't expecting an angelic encounter along the lines of what we find in Luke chapters 1 and 2? Well, as Richard Loveless would say, and here I'm drawing from his remarkable book, the dynamics of spiritual life, I would commend it to you 
in its entirety. And actually, Richard Lovelace just passed away this year. But he writes this, he says this, if you want to encounter a supernatural God and supernatural results in your spiritual life and also in the life of the church and in our world, you need to pursue supernatural means. And by supernatural means, he's referring to things like earnest prayer and and scripture immersion, singing songs of praise, and, and so forth. Dancing before the Lord. Pursue these kinds of means, church, and you can expect an earnest fear of the Lord to, to well up in your soul. Avoid them, avoid these means, and that usually happens on account of unbelief or doubt or or maybe busyness which is connected to unbelief and doubt and you'll open the door for an assortment of worldly fears to rush in and ransack the living room blaise pascal put it like this in his now very famous work called the ponces uh, specifically this is this is number 262 He writes this, he says, True fear comes from faith, and false fear comes from doubt. True fear is joined to hope because it is born of faith, and because men hope in God, the God in whom they believe. Would these be our marching orders this Advent season? And honestly, far beyond that, Would we crowd out false fear with the true fear of the Lord that comes from faith? It's not an easy journey. There aren't any shortcuts. It requires energy. It requires effort. And our earthly circumstances might well remain fraught with difficulties, and they could even get worse. But when we pursue this kind of fear of the Lord, There's a guaranteed blessedness in store for us, church. When we draw near to the Lord in this way, especially when we pursue these these supernatural means, He will draw near to us. It's a promise. Of course, we'll still have days that are better than other days. You can expect transformation even if gradual, you can expect a growing fear of the Lord grounded in the precious knowledge of his love. Love you, City Church. To this I say, amen. Every week at City Church, we approach the Lord's table together as the people of God. And we do so in large part to remember the love of God poured out for us in Christ, the crucified and risen Christ. We gather to remember that there is indeed so much love beneath the chaos that we're corporately experiencing right now. The Apostle Paul wrote that the Lord Jesus On the night that he was to be betrayed, shared a meal with his disciples, and during the meal, he took the bread and broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this whenever you eat of it. In remembrance of me. And then in a similar manner, after the meal, Jesus took the cup. And as he poured it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it. In remembrance of me. And the Apostle Paul says that, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again, and he will come again, church. That is our sure and certain hope that we are longing for even during this Advent season. This is a meal for followers of Jesus who know that they need a Savior. If that describes you, you are welcome to participate no matter where you're from. 
no matter what church that you might be a part of. Uh, we would love for you to enjoy this meal uh, simply um, after I pray for the meal, uh, eat and drink using whatever you have that's closest to bread and to the cup. And if you're, if you're enjoying this with somebody else, uh, maybe say to one another, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And then as you drink the cup, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you're watching this or listening to this and you don't profess to be a follower of Jesus, thank you. This is, a, this is for you. This is a, a YouTube channel or a iTunes uh, feed for you. We are glad that you are participating. You're welcome in the life of our church. Instead of taking a meal that you wouldn't say that you believe in, would you reflect on what we've just been talking about this morning? For the children of God, the children of God can experience the love of God even now. And if, that, if you're not one of those children, would you be one? Can't imagine a better way to wrap up what has been a very difficult 2020. We would love to talk with you more about that. Let me pray. Lord God, we do praise your name for this meal of remembrance, in which, in particular, I want to focus on the fact that we are remembering the love of God in Christ Jesus, the one who was in fact crucified and raised, the one who is with us every step of the way until the end of the age. Lord, as we reflect on this and the beauty and the, and the greatness of God, I pray that we would reflect as well, as hard as it may be in our sin. Lord, we have sinned, um, and you are a holy God. And so in light of that, we confess our sin and acknowledge our need for intervention, the kind of intervention that your son Jesus accomplished and applies to us by the agency of the cross, resurrection. We love you, Lord, so much, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
day you'll die to make us sons of God on high. Let every heart be there in room, the promises that won't come true. Oh, oh.
is mine. I give myself all to you, Jesus. Sing that chorus again. Hey church, thanks again for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, I'm Ryan, one of the pastors here, and uh, I want to share a word from uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 as our benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. 